You guys see if Nora's in there? There she is right there. Okay. All right. Well, we had a special request from a good buddy of mine, Senator Luke Cox. So I got a call Saturday saying, what's the message on Sunday? And I said, well, I don't know. Give me some ideas. And he said, how about the little drummer boy? Right? All right, Luke, this is for you. So this morning, this is dedicated to Senator Luke Cox. All right, I want to say a prayer. I say a prayer. Can I say it? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dear Jesus, thank you for today. We thank you for Christmas, Lord. Thank you for the children. We're so excited to get calls, to spend time with them, to see their smiles, and to know they're looking forward to a Christmas. Even if they don't understand the whole meaning, we know the parents one day will teach them. But what an exciting time for them. And Lord, we know you love kids. You said, let all the children come unto me. And Lord, I hope we do a good job of that here. Uh, if we want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, we have to have the spirit of a child. That's what you're looking for in each believer, in each convert, Lord, to be like a child, to love each other like children. When they see each other from a distance, they run, they hug each other, they play, they smile. And Lord, I pray we can do that as adults and never lose touch of that. So I just ask for your blessing upon this service this morning. Thank you for Luke's request. We ask an anointing upon this service, always above all things, that your name will be glorified. Lord, we thank you. Another thank you prayer was thank you for letting uh, Luke Wilson, or excuse me, Lane Wilson pass his a big exam, one of the hardest military exams that they offer, and he passed it this week, and is a full-fledged graduate for his uh, MOS. So Lord, thank you for that, his safety, his success, and I pray you give them a safe trip home. Uh, bringing him home to be with the family for 10 days. So thank you for all our answers to prayer. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for baby Nora and each one here, for his beautiful families. May we uh, glorify you above all things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. I got my help. Morning, everybody. Hey. Morning, everybody. Merry Christmas. Nora's going to help me preach. So this week, uh, I wrote up here, which I thought was interesting. What do Johnny Cash, Jack Black, Carrie Underwood, Bing Crosby, David Bowie, Pentatonix? Anybody know who Pentatonix is? You know they are? They're awesome, aren't they? They love Pentatonix. Pentatonix, the King of Country, and the Sound of Music. How many are fans of that? Now, that's my wife. I had no idea. Favorite movie. Favorite movie. Well, they all have the same thing in common, and that commonality is the little drummer boy. A lot of people don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe young men want to go to those. The Sound of Music is about the family, the Trap family, who uh, one of them was the, he, the, the father was a commandant, I think it was the Austrian Navy. And during World War II, uh, after serving, came to the United States. In 1951, actually, he came to the United States with his first wife and seven children. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see. There you go. <laughs> you want to go back to mommy and daddy? Okay. Yeah, you little sucker thief. <laughs> All right. But the commandant trap came over to the United States with his wife and seven children. While they were here, she passed away. He married a woman 25 years younger than he was and had three more children. So he had 10 children, which... It's kind of interesting. My grandfather's wife was 26 young, years younger than him. Actually, it was his second marriage. She was actually younger than his daughter, which was interesting. I don't know how that goes. But hey, man, you do things different in West Virginia. That's all I got to say. But great man, lived to be 101. But the Trapp family had 10 children. One just passed away. I think it was in 2020, 2019. There's one left. Still alive today. But they're the family that inspired the, the movie, The Sound of Music. The hills are alive. I know a lot of you know that. But they're the ones that did it. But they're also, some people don't know, maybe you do. They're the ones that brought the little drummer boy to fame in 1951. So let me just read through this. And then um, we'll have our hopefully special visitor by then. I'm trying to kill some time here. So, uh-oh, shiny shoes is up. So yeah, okay. The little drummer boy was originally known as Carol of the Drums, written by American composer Catherine Kennett. 
Davis in 1941. She was born in Missouri in 1892 and composed, this is really interesting, I hope this is an inspiration to some of the kids, she composed her first piece of music at 15 years old. When she died, she had written over 600 songs and left her fortune to the school that she attended that helped her reach this success. The song was based upon a French Christmas carol called Patapan. It's written in French by Bernard de la Monnier, and it was written in 1641, or around uh, 1720, 1641, 1720. Its original title, which I thought was pretty cool, is Willie Bring Your Little Drum to Town. Or Willie Bring Your Little Drum, or Willie Take Your Little Drum. Later, Bernard Marnoia, the, the writer, translated the song uh, of the writer Patapan, translated the song into English. He was a French attorney, he was a, a philanthropist, he was a poet, um, a, he was a critic of some writings, and he was known chiefly for writing Christmas carols. A lot of people don't know, and I've read on him, uh, is that he went bankrupt and lived basically off the royalties, luckily from his books. He went bankrupt, he got sued because he was an attorney, some stuff happened. But the carol resolves, uh, revolves, even the original carol re, uh, revolves around the birth of Jesus Christ and is told from the per perspective of shepherds playing simple instruments, and patapan that is, flutes and drums. The patapan word is used to mimic the sound of a drum, patapan. And it gives this song uh, its name. The, uh, the uh, let me, sorry, I just lost my thing real quick. It's meant, so it's the drum, patapan, is meant to complement an accompanying lyric, tura lu ra lu. We've heard that before, tura lu ra lu. That's actually supposed to represent the sound of the flute. So the two of them play together. Well, Catherine Davis was obsessed with this song, and in 1941, when she was trying to take a nap, Patapan came into her head. Patapan translated her mind to pa rum pa pum pum You want to say that with me? pa rum pa pum pum eh. uh, how, how, We all do it when the song comes on, am I right? pa rum pa pum pum and it took on a rhythm in her mind, and the result was the little drummer boy. Her song, The Little Drummer Boy, appealed to the Austrian singing group, the Trap Family Singers, who are featured and focused on in The Sound of Music. The Trap Family were refugees from World War II. The father was a commandant in the Austrian Navy, and he and his wife had seven children, which I told before. When she passed, he married another woman. They had three more, and they had ten children. They migrated to the United States and traveled around the world singing this song specifically, but raising money for those displaced and starved by World War II. That's pretty, I thought that was amazing. There's one living child today, and they're responsible to bring the song to wider prominence when they recorded it for Decca Records in 1951. Now, this is where it gets pretty interesting. The song was further popularized by Harry Simeon when 20th Century Fox Records contracted Simeon to record a Christmas album. His album, which included The Little Drummer Boy, hit number 13 on the Billboard charts. Number 24 and 60 to 61, 22 and 61 and 62, 28 and 62 and 63 on the Billboard charts. Another group, the Jack Holleran Singers, made it to 96 in 1961. Over the years, The Little Drummer Boy has been recorded by many artists, some even appearing on Billboard singles charts. David Bowie and Bing Crosby peaked at number three in the United Kingdom. It spent, three, it spent 10 weeks on the charts from 1982 to 1983. Jack Black and John Siegel reached 45 in 2010. Uh, they did it on the, the digital chart. Pentatonix hit number one. If you've heard them, you know why. They're fantastic. I love, by the way, Mary Did You Know is my favorite that they do. Fantastic. Pentatonix hit number one with it in the winter of 2013 and 2014. So this is recent, which I love. And Carrie Underwood recorded it in 2022. And the legend, if you guys have a place for this man in your heart, I know I do. Johnny Cash charted it, Little Drummer Boy, in 1963, and he went to 63, according to what I read. Little Drummer Boy is set around the time of Jesus' birth when Israel was under Roman rule. At the time, as we know, the Jews were awaiting a Messiah to deliver them from bondage and become the king of Israel. Unlike most Christmas carols, this sets us apart uh, about the nativity story, such as the first Noel, away in a manger, come all you faithful, silent night, and O holy night, which is my favorite carol. This one places the emphasis on a different child. The emphasis in the little drummer boy is on the little drummer boy. When he's summoned to honor the newborn king who lies in a manger in Bethlehem, the poor boy couldn't afford to buy a gift. Uh, he, he, excuse me, 
Uh, he couldn't afford to buy something that would be fit for someone who was of royalty. So he offers his talent instead. He taps out a parumpa pum pum rhythm on his drum, and the baby Jesus smiles. Without a gift for the infant, the little drummer boy played his drum with approval from Jesus and his mother, recalling, I played my best for him, and he smiled at me. Now, there's no such little drummer boy in reality. In the biblical account of Christ's birth, it's a metaphor example of the drummer boy's determination and intention to play his best for Jesus. And it actually exemplifies a verse, and I think we could remember this verse. I think most of us know it. Uh, Colossians 3, 23 and 24, which says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. The things that you do as a volunteer, the things that you do here, do it to God. Forget who's looking at you. Forget what anybody says. It doesn't matter. But it says, do whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. And I think there's a lesson for us and that many of us have very little to give. There's a lot of us have very little to give. God knows this, but it is important that we give, number one, from a pure heart, with pure intentions, with the intention to please our Savior, to please our Lord. No matter what others think, no matter what others say, and no matter who is watching, it doesn't matter. You give what you have with the best of your ability to honor your Father. Number two, that we always give God our best. I remember when I, um, and this is, a, I guess, a personal message here, but when I served in Army Rangers and Special Forces, and then I went to the state police, but there's only one in each state. There's only 50 state police agencies. There's 30,000 other police departments. And so I felt when I was serving my country, when I served my state and my family, that I wanted to serve in the best. So I served in the Rangers and the State Police, which I felt was the best. And I went on to federal agencies. But, but this is the attitude we need to have towards Christ. So then I said, well, what can I do when I retire to serve my father? Protected me all these years. Yeah, I've had guns. I've had, been shot at. I've, I've had a lot of those things. So I have to be chases. You've seen cops. I've been at lived it. And God protected me. So I said, how can I give God my best? And I went to Bible college. Now, I could have went to Bible college for four or five years, got a degree, and started preaching, but I waited about 15. And the reason was, I, I know I am not a great preacher. I'm never going to be on network TV, but I do my best. And I wanted to do that unto God, so I waited an extended amount of time so I was sure that I knew the Bible before I ever got in the pulpit. And you guys know, every sermon here is biblically based and always will be biblically based. So number two, that we give God our best. We aren't all wealthy. Some of us, including your preacher, can't sing. Some don't have much to offer, but their loyalty, their love, their service. And by the way, some of you do that very well here. This church does well because most of you do that. Your loyalty, your love, your service, and your dedication, more importantly, to Jesus Christ. And by the way, most of us are glad you're here. In our mind, this is a no judgment zone. Come relax. And enjoy Jesus Christ. And I want you to know, and this is again from my heart, I want you to know that I, I preach every message won't be a home run. I know that. I know I'm not a great preacher, but I promise you each week I'll give you the best I can as I hear from God. I pray, and I waited until Saturday. I'm like, I have nothing. Heidi's like, what are you going to preach? I really don't know. And Stu called me and says, Luke may not come Sunday. And I said, well, why not? He said, he wants to know if you're preaching on the little drummer boy. I said, will he come if I preach on a little drummer boy? And he said, yes, he will. So there he is. So thanks for being here, Luke, and thanks for requesting this message. So that uh, I want you to know, so I preach, and everything I preach is based on biblical truth. I love to spend time. This is my gift, though, is to spend time with you face to face. So I let you know I love you. I care about you. Preaching is only about 10% of what I do as a pastor. It's only about 10% of what I do on a weekly basis. Most of you know that. I've had suicide calls. I've had a, a mom call me when, when her husband had a gun to her head one night. And we had to handle that. I mean, there's things that happen. When we've been here, we've raised over $300,000 in the last 10 years. We've baptized over 80 people. That's amazing. Look what this church is doing. And a lot of you don't know. You are, I think I said this a little bit last week. You are a global ministry now. 10 years ago, you may not have been. Today, because of, uh, and I can't really forget the name of this ministry, because it's just International Association of Grace Ministries joined us when we started sponsoring Pakistan, and 
We doubled the size of that ministry in Pakistan by helping them. We married two churches together that were working separate and independent from each other in Pakistan. Now they're together due to the work of Sugar Tree Ridge and the uh, International Grace Ministries. So we all, we have uh, we've done VBS barbecues, uh, food banks, established a national presence. We are in uh, Louisiana, Washington, Alaska, Ohio, Maryland, Florida, Texas, Kentucky, and Oklahoma. And for eight years, we've done over 400 Bible studies. We had 12 to 15 people. Some never came to one of those Bible studies, but we still did them. And so this church is doing So this is only about 10% of what I do is preach. I worry about you. I call you. I check on you. Uh, last week, I apologized, and I have to, I think, because I was exhausted when I came to church. I was have not been feeling well for a couple of weeks. Larry knows we talk. I got sugar now, yay. Um, I need a shoulder replacement, yay. I got two herniated discs in my back. Woo-hoo. We're doing good, but we're trying the best we can. At 1.30 in the morning, somebody tried to get in my house and banging on my door. I came exhausted, exhausted. So I apologize for that. And I did the, well, the best I could trying to bring up the, uh, oh, come on, you faithful. I know, I know, I rumor had it, somebody got upset about that, and I'm sorry. I preached a carol. They wanted, uh, uh, you know, they wanted me to know that I shouldn't preach carols, but I'm sorry for that. But I, this was a request, not, oh, are you okay? How's your family, Rob? Can we pray for you? Did the guy actually get in your house? Nothing. And I imagine Jesus and Moses and the little drummer boy, you know, how would they feel if people told him what to preach, how to preach, how long to preach? The little drummer boy didn't do that. He played a song. He played his best. He gave what he had. And Jesus smiled. I can't imagine Jesus being challenged. Don't preach too long. Don't preach that. Don't play that. I can't imagine that. And I'm not going to put up with it any longer. I'm going to do the best I can. Don't we face enough adversity and challenges in the world? The Bible says the devil prowls about seeking whom he may destroy. Be careful the devil isn't using you. We all have difficulties. We shouldn't come to our church and our father's house and fear the same judgment. This is what I want everybody to know. You can come here and relax. You shouldn't fear the same judgment, adversities, and difficulties that you face in the world. The church should be a safe house, a place of rest, a place to block out judges and focus on God without worrying about who's watching. A place where everybody knows your name. I will always say that. I love the cheers. I don't believe in that. Drinking alcohol, even though I collect it. But... You go to Cheers and everybody's glad you're there. Everybody knows your name. But my, my hope is that when you come in here, you're treated that way and that you walk out happier than you were when you came in. <clears throat> so, final thought. I think our guest is here. In, Matt, in Mark 12 and Luke 21, it says Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and observed how the crowd put money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums of money. Then a poor widow came and put in two small coins worth a few cents. Then he called his disciples to himself. By the way, he had a remark how beautiful the temple was, however, how beautiful everybody was dressed. But he called his disciples to bring them down to reality. And he said, I tell you this, this poor widow put more than all the other contributors into the treasury today. They've all contributed from their surplus wealth, but she, from her poverty, has contributed all she gave, all she could give, her whole livelihood. Jesus is teaching at the temple. And by the way, the word might is an improper translation. That word didn't come around to around the 1600s. The word that she gave was actually called a lepta. Lepta. The Greek word is lepta. And a lepton was the smallest and least valuable coin in circulation in Judea, worth about six minutes of your time. It's about six minutes of a daily wage, but it was all she had to offer. And she gave it, and Jesus smiled. In 1 Samuel 15, it says, Does the Lord experience as much joy in burnt offerings and sacrifices as he does to the people who obey his voice? Behold, it's better to sacrifice and listen to God than to sacrifice the fat of rams. In Acts uh, 4.19 and Acts 5.29, Peter and John answered the Pharisees when they were told not to preach, whether it was right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God. You must judge, and they declared we must obey God rather than man. And so I got some final quotes in closing. Giving is not, and this is mine, this is giving is not about making a donation, 
It's about obedience to God, about pure intention, about making a difference. We make a living, this is Winston Churchill, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. <clears throat> Mother Teresa said, it's not how much we give, but how much we love giving. And one of my favorites and my favorite actor says this, Denzel Washington says this, at the end, it's not about what you have or even what you've accomplished. It's about who you've lifted up and who you've made better. It's about what you've given back in Zell Washington. And so my gift every year is the best I can to take care of you, to pray for you, and preach the best I can. Preaching is about 10% of what I do, but it's my gift. And I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you like it, and I hope it makes you better, and I hope from here on we can continue to do better and do more so that when you go out, you're encouraged and build up, ready to face the challenges of the world. So... Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your word. We thank you for everyone here that gives sacrificially to make this a reality for people. We can come, worship you, be happy, be safe, and feel good about loving Jesus. I pray we facilitate that, and I pray we always honor your name above all things. In Jesus' name, amen.